All right, uh, chapter 9 of Chemistry in Context, Chem 102. This one, in this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the world of polymers and plastics, and that's the entire content of this. You're going to be exposed to polymers and plastics, but you're not going to be experts in polymer and plastics. But you will take a different view of them, hopefully, at the end of, of this, this particular uh, lecture. You're going to know what a pol you're going to discover what polymers are. And what can, uh, where can you find polymers in everyday life? And you know this already, but we're going to help uh, reemphasize it and tell you why they're like that. How polymers synthesize. How do we make them? How do we manufacture them? What kinds of polymers can be recycled? And that's a very, very important topic. And how are polymers recycled? What do we do to do that? What are some unique applications of polymers? You will be exposed to all of this. Chapter 9 is an exposure class to polymers, not an in-depth uh, dive into uh, polymer science. Okay? All right. These are important definitions that we expect you to know when it comes to polymers. Polymers are large molecules made up of long chains of atoms covalently bonded together. Absolutely, every word in this uh, definition is important. They are large molecules. They are made up of long chains, and that's important. And those long, chain of, long chains of atoms, covalently bonded together, means that there's a permanent bond between them, and that's important. Since it's a permanent bond, we know it has potential energy, right? So if we burn the polymer, we can recapture some of that energy, albeit maybe low amount, but there's energy contained in the bonds. These polymers are made from what we call monomers. Okay, monomer means one uh, unit. So we have these monomers, okay, that produce polymers. So we start with monomers and we work our way to polymers through a process called polymerization. So these are the small molecules that we make the chains from, and this author likes to uh, suggest it is like a strand of paper clips. Uh, that is one uh, example of how to describe this, although there are some flaws, I think, in his, uh, his use of paper clips. It does help you to get the concept that it's chains. But it's more like pearls, okay, uh, where you have pearls and they're together. They're not intertwined. For example, these links are across over each other. They're just pearls and they're all lined up, or better yet, like train, like uh, trains where they couple, and so you have one train car coupled to the next, and next, and next, and next. If all the tr if all the cars on the train are alike, they call it a homopolymer. Okay, if they're different uh, car uh, rail cars on the track, they would call that a copolymer. Okay, so we have. Monomers, they make polymers, and all the chains are the same. Okay, it's a homopolymer. If they are different, then it's a copolymer. You get it? So keep that in mind. It's important that you know those terms. Okay, Homo homopolymer means every, all the monomers are the same. Copolymer means the monomers are different. All right. Now, polymers, you, you've been exposed to polymers. If you've ever been out for a walk and you touched a tree and it was sappy and you got sticky all over, that was a polymer. So polymers are part of nature. They've been around since the dawn of man. Natural polymers include cellulose, starch, tar, shellac, tortoise shell, and horns, as well as tree sap that produce amber and latex. So when you see the amber, uh, that's a polymer. The latex is a polymer. Uh, beeswax, etc., all polymers. These polymers were processed with heat and pressure into useful articles like hair ornaments and jewelry. So what happened originally, you would get natural polymers out of nature, out of plants, and you would process them in some fashion, and people would use them. Example of where uh, this has been used in 18, early, ever since the 1800s, uh, scientists and, and technologists and engineers have taken natural polymers and they would do a process called vulcanization. What vulcanization does is take a polymer of a certain size, it treats it with some materials and heat, and it makes it even larger. So they would take, for example, latex out of a tree, and they would vulcanize it and do it with sulfur materials, 
and they would make rubber they could use for tires, for bike tires or, or what have you, okay? And so that's how we uh, take natural polymers and transform them into useful materials. Today, we do a lot of synthetic polymers, and that's where we get our plastic bottles from. We get these through, through synthesis. However, these monomers for many of the hydrocarbons, and we're on the slide called hydrocarbons, the backbone of most polymers, the, the monomers for these come from the petrochemical industry, which is why petrochemical industry is still so important to us, because you still want your plastic chairs. You want a plastic cover for your cell phone. Okay? You'd like to have inexpensive furniture, so you need polymers and plastics. All right? And so we get the monomers from the petrochemical industry. So polymers are referred to as micromolecules because they involve thousands of atoms, and their um, molecular mass is over a million. We expect you to know that. So micro means large molecules, thousands of atoms, and the molecular masses are over a million. Many common classes of polymers are called hydrocarbons. They come from the petrochemical industry. They have hydrogen and they have carbon. They have carbon along the backbone and affixed to, the, to the, each of the carbon units are hydrogen groups. And this is why they call them hydrocarbons, containing hydrogen and, and carbon. One example is poly, polyethylene. We're all familiar with plat. We just simply call it plastic, right? Polyethylene, the simplest polymer structure. It's just simply carbon and hydrogen. That's it. Nothing else. No other fancy groups on it at all. An example uh, is uh, polypropylene itself, polybutylene, and polystyrene. And you're going to see some examples of what these, uh, what, where these plastics are used. And we're going to also classify them according to their ability to be recycled. Each plastic has a recycling code now and uh, you're going to learn those. But in the end, we have hydrocarbons that are polymers. Okay, and this is a huge application of, of hydrocarbon technology from the petrochemical industry. You recall the barrel of oil that we talked about in earlier chapters and how it's refined to at least 20 gallons of fuel for your small economy car, and for a large truck like mine, that would be two barrels of oil because I need at least more, I need more than 20 gallons of fuel. On the top of that, that barrel, we found some volatile materials, small amount, less than 10, uh, 10 gallons out of the 55 gallon, close to 7 or 8, or star materials or raw materials we use to make the plastics that you enjoy. Okay. So how do we get to those plastics? We polymerize them. And this is called addition polymerization. Addition polymerization is perhaps by far the leading process for making, for manufacturing uh, polymers, or at least certainly for manufacturing uh, many of the polymers that are generally used that are commodity items. And how does that work? Well, it works by what's called a free radical. You might recall free radical we talked about uh, when we talk about environmental impact, where the radicals would attack ozone, and it would cause ozone to attack other things, and it would destroy what's called the Chapman cycle. In, in nature, well, these free radicals can be used in a, in a constructive way to make plastics, make polymers that we use as plastics in our everyday use, and that's by what's called free radical uh, polymerization. I don't expect you to be able to carry out free radical polymerizations in freshman chemistry, but I do expect you to know that addition polymerization is by free radical initiation of the reaction. Okay? That I do expect you to know. And here we show you some examples of, of polymers, of polyethylene polymers that are, that are used uh, here in everyday use, the mustard uh, tub uh, bubbles for packing, which my Shih Tzu absolutely loves and thinks that's a treat uh, to pop them. And we have milk jugs, and then we have um, laundry detergent jugs. So we have these applications of this free radical polymerization and we've, this free radical polymerization of what we call olefins or double bonds to form the polyethylene. When we form uh, polyethylene and plastics and we stretch them, that process of stretching them, which we call necking, uh, allows the chains 
that have this inter I-N-T-E-R molecular, it's very important you differentiate that it's I-N-T-E-R molecular forces, these intermolecular forces are what cause it to have a little bit of stress when we pull the plastic, then all of a sudden once it starts to neck, it pulls easy. That's because each of these chains has an interaction between them called dispersive forces, and these forces allow them to stay together, but if you pull enough, it, you can overcome those, and we can stretch it, and that's called necking. So, dispersive forces are attractive forces between the molecules in the polymer that hold the material together. So you have all these chains, it's like spaghetti, and it's basically intertangled spaghetti, and you pull it, and we stretch the spaghetti out. Stretching and necking, a plastic bag, illustrates the stress needed to overcome inter, I-N-T-E-R, molecular forces between adjacent polymer chains. So we have all these adjacent polymer chains, they're there, and they're written, they're all bunched together, and we stretch them, and that's how we uh, reduce the intermolecular forces between the chains, and it allows to stretch, and again, we call that process necking. So what else should we tell you about these polymers? Well, polymers can have linear structures or branched, Okay. There's some others, but in this class, we only talk about two of them, linear and branch polymers. All right, when we talk about uh, branching, alters the physical properties of a polymer as polyethylene. So that's the purpose of branching. If you want to change, you have one material that you bought from the petrochemical industry, and it was ethylene, and you made polyethylene, but you want to change the properties of polyethylene, you branch it. Okay? All right? So branching also physical properties of the polymer, such as polyethylene. High-density polyethylene, uh, HDPE, has greater rigidity, is more rigid, has greater strength, and a uh, melting point, and a higher melting point than low-density polyethylene. Okay? Why is that? Well, the dispersive forces are stronger along the polymer chain than along the branches. In other words, take a look at the diagram. The diagram, the, the structures on the far left in A and B are examples of, of poly, uh, of non-branched polyethylene. So we have the non-branched polyethylene heat shown here, and then on the far right we have the branched polyethylene. In the case of the non-branched, this is called HDPE because the stacking is better when it's, when it's, non, when it's linear, non-branched. It's like stacking these chairs. As long as the, all the chairs are the same, they stack really well. We'll bring in, take one of the red chairs, try to put it over one of the cream chairs or whatever you call it, chair, blue chairs today, that you're sitting in, then there's, they're not going to stack the same. So here's a key take-home principle and point that you must remember in this class. Branching uh, linear polymers have higher density than branched polymers. Okay? Got it? So, if I, if I ask that question on the exam, you'll get it right every time. Okay? All right, if it's linear, it's higher, it's higher density because it has higher dispersion forces, which means it's also more rigid, which means it has higher strength and also a higher melting point. Absolutely any points on this slide are fair game for my exam. Continue to move at a relatively fast pace. More than 60,000 synthetic polymers are known. That's a lot of polymers, folks. Okay? And each of them are, have, have their own unique names. Okay? Of these 60,000 polymers, six types account for 75% of what's used around the world. So these are the important six types that we expect you to be familiar with in Chem 102. We expect you to know HDPE, high density, and where it's used. In this case, milk jugs. They're opaque. The reason they're opaque is because it's high density. Higher density leads to less clarity. Okay? Lower density, more clarity. So when you see a clear plastic bag, you now know, oh, that's probably uh, low, low, low density. If you see an opaque, 
you say, ah, it's probably high density. Okay? And you can tell if you go through, look at any plastic, if you can see through it, it's, low de it's probably low density. If you can't see through it very well, it's probably higher density or high density. That's how we know no plastics. And I would ask you questions like that. I would, I would say that someone had a, a clear plastic. Is it more likely to be low density or high density? Okay? All right? Those would be the types of questions that would be fair game. Okay? Uh, low density bags, bubble wrap, wire insulation, that's where they're used. PVC is a very special uh, polymer. Uh, for plumbing pipes, these are the white pipes that you see in your home. Well, you don't see them. They're in your wall somewhere. But if you look underneath your sink, you might, you might find them there. Garden hoses. PVC. This is why they tell you don't drink out of garden hoses. <laughs> but all your grandmas and grandpas did it. Most of them live to be 120. Okay. <laughs> so that's why they tell you don't do it. Egg cartons. Don't eat the egg cartons. Same reason. No, I'm sorry. Shower curtains. <laughs> don't chew on your shower curtains. All right. You got it? They're PVC. Not a healthy thing to do. Then we have polystyrene. Polystyrene, food wrap, foam cups, insulation containers, egg cartons. At one point, McDonald's uh, was one of the big consumers of polystyrene in the, for the food industry. Uh, until their, the Ronald McDonald's started showing up in the landfills and in the ocean and washing up on beaches around the world. And it really bothered people who are environmentally conscious that McDonald's was advertising, actually. So you go to landfill, see McDonald's, okay, and they made a change because it fell under scrutiny of the amount of polystyrene that was non-biodegradable that was showing up with their logo on it. So they changed the paper. There's your history point there. Uh, polypropylene, bottle caps, <clears throat> cream and margarine containers, and then PETE, or PET, soft drink bottles, and carpet and yarn. Now, when you compare polypropylene, bottle caps, and PET, you notice you have the plastic bottle caps on your, on your PET bottles. This is why they ask you to, to uh, when, you just, when you recycle them, to put them in two different recycling areas. And in fact, uh, some places won't recycle the, P, the polypropylene. Don't ask me. There's lots of reasons why. But this is why they ask you to separate the, the bottle cap from there because they're going to go to different recycling places. Okay? So that's kind of one of the things why they ask you to do it. So these are the ones we expect you to be familiar with. And note the last statement here. All six of these uh, varieties are thermoplastic polymers, which means they can be melted and reshaped again. That's why we want to make sure we recycle and reuse them. If we reuse them, that means there's less plastic being manufactured. That means the power station right, gets to reduce some of its energy, and oh, by the way, we don't have to dig for fossil fuels, right, because when we dig for fossil fuels, that means we're putting more NOx and SOx in the atmosphere, and oh, by the way, if we have an accident off the coast, we're going to hurt the dolphins and the fish, okay, and also, we're going to allow more greenhouse gases into the environment, so now we understand why recycling is important, even though we need these plastics, we enjoy a lifestyle with plastics, the question is whether or not we will be responsible with them. So here's how we deal with it. We recycle, and these are the recycling codes. I expect you to know the far left and the far right of, of, of these. I expect you to know that poly LDPE is 4 and HDPE is 2. They are not the same. They both are polyethylene, but they're a different type of polyethylene. And you now know that LDPE is probably what? Branched, right? And HDP is probably linear. Then we have PVC, which stands, uh, well, which is used again for your plumbing applications, and it has a, has a three code. And one of the reasons we really want to be uh, careful about where we put PVC is because when it's burned and consumed, it creates HCL. And that's not healthy for us, okay? So we expect you to know these. We also expect you to know the other part of the big six is polystyrene. Polystyrene is used a lot, again, in food containers. And it's also used for CD and DVD uh, cases as well, the clear DVD cases 
or the clear CD cases, which you know absolutely nothing about because you don't buy them, you do downloads, all right? But for the old, for your parents and the old people who still go to the Target and Walmart just to buy a CD that sounds ridiculous to you when you can download it, okay? This is what they get and bring home, and you see it on their shelves, and they stand back and they stare at it and feel good that they made that purchase. That's what they're doing. It's nostalgia. But that's what they are. They're made of polystyrene. Then you have polypropylene, all right? Again, the yoga cups, ball caps, and then we have polyethylene, uh, polyethylene uh, terephthalate, uh, which is, again, a homopoly, a copolymer. I'm sorry. Let me say it again. P-E-T-E, PET, is a copolymer, okay? And so be aware of that, all right? You know, it's a copolymer because it has more than one monomer unit in it. When we make these polymers, these pl that we turn into plastics, they're made and they have these different what's called domains within them. And within they'll have a crystalline part where they have basically like this, and then the others are like this, all right? They're, they're perfectly aligned for the crystalline part, we show you in the red. And then they're not so aligned for the green part, which is called amorphous. So the red is crystalline, this is amorphous, and this is what gives the polymer its properties. Okay? This is not a question of which better or worse. It depends on the application. And so the crystallinity, along with the amorphous character, is what gives, helps give the polymer its characteristics. So polymers have regions of crystallinity, where in polymer molecules arranged in a regular array. They're exactly aligned. They're, they're really well organ, organized. You might, and then we have amorphous. Uh, other parts of polymer will have amorphous region where the polymer molecules are found to be random, disordered, and array in their arrangement. Okay, you got it? So it's random here. It's very disordered. This is very well organized, right? Crystalline regions impart strength and abrasion resistance found in polyethylene and polypropylene. Okay? So crystalline regions impart strength and abrasion resistance. So, how do we put these polymers together? How do they exactly polymerize? Well, this is not going to be an in-depth uh, uh, discussion on how they polymerize but we want to expose you to the basic uh, mechanism or basic process by which the attachment occurs. And there are three ways we talk about how they attach, how they couple. The first is called a head-to-tail, head-to-tail. In a monomer, which is what we make polymers from, monomers become polymers, and in this case by addition polymerization, by uh, radical addition polymerization, excuse me, by a stepwise radical polymerization in which the head has a functionality and the tail has no functionality. So in this case, we would have the head would attack the tail, would attack the head, would attack the tail, would attack the head, would attack the tail, and goes on until we get lots and lots of units, right? We want to get over what? Over thousands of units and over a million molecular weight. We also have what we call tail to what? Tail to head, head to head. So you could have the tail to tail, right? And then the head to head is what would have so. And this gives you another type of polymer. And then we can have random, where we don't know what it's really going to do head to tail, tail to head, head to head, tail to tail, etc. When we consider these, head to tail, head to tail tends to give, high, give a higher density because is more ordered and allows the intermolecular dispersion forces to better align themselves and find more strength. The random tends to give lower, a lower density because, again, the polymer chains cannot align themselves as well for the, dispersive, uh, for the dispersion forces. And the tail-to-tail, head-to-head lies somewhere in between. So, vinyl chloride, polypropylene, and styrene, vinyl chloride, Polypropylene and polystyrene mon monomers uh, undergo addition polymerization, and this is addition, uh, radical addition, stepwise polymerization. It happens in steps. Follow? 
Many different arrangements are possible that we've shown you in the, in the diagrams on the left side. So, uh, okay. And because of this orientation, we get different properties. That is a take-home message. The orientation of the polymers is what gives you the different properties. Okay. The orientation is different. You're going to get different properties. And this is what chemists do. Polymer chemists make a living doing this uh, all year round, all the time. Another example of this step rise, radical polymerization, which we call addition uh, polymerization. This addition polymerization is styrene. Same process. In this particular case, we show you a head to tail. Okay, then it's tail to head. I mean, head to tail. Uh, sorry, head to tail, head to tail. In the in the case of polystyrene, and again, you already know some of the applications. These are shown on a different slide. So the take home here is that we have three polymers that we've introduced you to that are used a lot in the in uh, our daily lives that are made by radical ad addition polymerization that poly the polyethylenes polypropylenes then we have the PVCs and we have the polystyrene but there are other ways we can make these polymers and the uh, that the other one I'm going to expose you to in here is what we call condensation polymerization. Please note the following. Condensation polymerization produces water as its byproduct. That is an important feature of uh, condensation. Okay? If we see water in the equation, that means it's condensation. Condensation produces water as the byproduct. In the case of radical addition polymerization, we don't get a byproduct. So in this particular case, we show you PET, this particular poly, the polyester, and we show you three different monomers that are used to form an ester bond, shown in this diagram as blue. Okay, And we show you the site of addition that continues, and look at the byproduct, water, therefore it is condensation. If you see water, it's condensation. And these are esters. Um, being able to do that, I am not requiring 102 students to be able to do this chemistry, I, but I do expect you to recognize the chemistry. So I need you to be able to recognize that this is an ester bond and it's condensation, and you know it's condensation by water. So the part in blue, you want to stare at a lot. Another area where we make, uh, where we use condensation polymerization is in forming protein or peptide bonds. We make these proteins be a peptide bonds in our body. And that's really kind of a good thing because water, yeah, is okay in the body. So here we start with an acid, which is called a carboxylic acid. It's actually an amino acid to be very specific in the body. This is an amino acid, which is in, uh, which, with the functionality being a carboxylic group. So we have this amino acid, and it condenses with itself. Condenses means it's going to generate water. And we continue to condense and condense and condense, and we make proteins. So a peptide bond is a covalent bond that forms between a carboxylic acid group and one amino acid in the amine of the next acid and it goes on and on and on and on each time it condenses it spits out at least one molecule of water so we have polyester that's formed by condensation polymerization and we have proteins that's formed by um, condensation polymerization And we also have nylon that's formed by condensation polymerization. And nylon was a substitute for silk. And in fact, polyester was also an attempt to beat the nylon that was formed as a, as a uh, substitute for silk. Okay? So nylon. So we have nylon, and this is a pretty famous, uh, this is a pretty famous reaction um, by DuPont, and it's still used today to manufacture carpets. 
uh, and we use uh, these particular monomers here. You can see them shown here. So we have the dipic acid and hexamethylene, diamine, so it's a diacid and it's a diamine. And when they form, they form the equivalent of a peptide bond or an amide bond with the elimination of water. So in a sense, nylon, the reaction in nylon is mimicking the process in the body to form proteins. So everyone follow that. Okay? So that's nylon. So it's not, again, it's another example of how knowing what's natural and what's part of nature led to a scientific discovery of how to make a useful material synthetically in the laboratory. So, there we have it, these polymers. We're making them and we're using them. We go to the supermarket and we pick up plastic bags, okay? Many of our outfits are, are nylons or polyesters or some combination there. We walk around with water bottles. These are all these wonderful things. But what do we do to help the environment with this? And that's one of the things that we talk a lot about in this particular class and is how do we, uh, how do we balance our needs that people need with the environment? and protect the environment. So there are these four principles that we talk about exactly the way they're shown on this slide. Each time we talk about them, they're always like this. They're always in this order each time we talk about them. We talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, the four R's of recycling. And so when we talk about reduce, the amount of material used, for instance, use less plastic in the production of bottles. In other words, make your bottle thinner. Make your plastic bags thinner, okay? All right? Use less sheets. Use thinner sheets of plastics for certain applications. If it's just a simple windbreak or you want to just cover up your flowers, maybe you don't need the heavy-duty plastic for that. You got it? So this would talk about reduce the amount. And this helps the environment because we know the monomers for the plastics come through the fossil fuel industry. Then reuse. For example, going to the grocery stores, you could take your plastic bag back in your hip pocket. When you walk in, they, you buy a block of gum at the, at the, at the supermarket, 7-Eleven, and they hand your bag, say, no, I'm good, put it in your pocket, because as soon as you walk out, you're going to pull out the plastic bag, stick it in, and chuck it in the first trash can you get to. Okay? You get it? So these are examples of re, re, reuse. Okay? All right? Recycle as much as we can. Recycle, 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 recycle. Not much else we can say about that except recycle. Then recover. Either the materials or the energy in the material can be recycled. Okay, for example, burn unrecyclable plastic that contain a high energy content. And that's the challenging part to find those plastic with a high enough energy content to make it worth the number of pounds you have to put into the, you have to travel around the world to carry. Because now you're using fuel to get it to the site. Follow? So all these have to be calculated, and there are engineers that do this, and people they call project managers around the world who look at these things, and they say it's better for us to do, put it here than there to help the environment. So the four R's of recycle, again, are reduce, reuse, recycle, recover. That brings us to this slide, which helps us to look at how we are using these plastics and how these plastics are distributed. Composition of municipal solid waste. Municipal solid waste includes all sources such as waste from industry, agriculture, mining, and construction sites. All of it matters. In the U.S., there are 254 million tons per year. That's a lot of hills, isn't it? A lot of recycling hills. Okay? The majority of municipal waste includes a paper, food, yarn, yard trimmings. <laughs> and uh, plastic, all right? So there you have it, and I expect you to be able to at least know these in the, in the order. I don't think I really need you to know the exact percentages, but I think you should be familiar with what's the highest, what's the lowest, and what's in between, follow? So if you can put these in order, we really, that would really work. But I think you really want to have an idea where it lies, right? So if you know paper, it's about 30%, right? 25%, 30% paper. So you want to have an idea about that because it's important. Now perhaps you understand why I try to do at least homework. This is our way of giving back to the environment. We tell you now. That's why I, don't, I say, don't give me paper. I try to emphasize that. Don't give me paper. I'm really trying to work on a way that we can do our 
exams electronically, so we get rid of scantrons. I haven't quite gotten there yet, okay? But that's why we're doing it, because we want to help the environment. We want to do our part, so don't give me paper. Got it? That's why we do it. And yard trimmings, you know, find a place to, re re to, to compost if you can. Food, you know, not quite as wasteful, and, it's, and we recognize it's challenging. And here's an area where we talk about metals. Cell phones, we don't recycle. Over 90% of cell phones are not recycled, okay? Most of them are sitting, I'm sorry, are, yeah, are not recycled. Most of them are in a landfill or in your drawer at home. And so there's an area where we can really improve because the metals from that are precious metals that cost a lot and they cost a lot to refine, which means cost a lot, because a lot of energy use, a lot of energy use means you're burning the burners at the power plant a lot longer, a lot harder, or you're running a nuclear power plant a little, little harder. And so everywhere we can reduce helps in that regard. And that brings the plastic from renewable materials. How do we deal with this from renewable materials? Polymers originating from renewable materials such as wood, cotton, fibers, starch, or sugar are different from petroleum-based polymers. They're different, okay? And petroleum-based means what? Fossil fuel. So the renewable materials, they are compostable, which is very, very important. They're able to undergo biological decomposition to form materials that contain non-toxic materials. In other words, the microbes in the earth will decompose them or the conditions of the ground of the earth will decompose them. Their uh, synthesis involves fewer resources, requires less waste, and use less energy. These are concepts that we expect you to be very familiar with. They do not contain chlorine and fluorine, and you know what happened with chlorine and fluorine, right? Chlorine and fluorine produce these radicals that are bad actors against ozone, which when it circulates around the world, it likes to find itself to Antarctica, where there's a very good environmental laboratory, natural environment in the air that allows them to sit in a rag with ozone in a way which is not healthy, which is, frankly, destructive to ozone, and we get a hole that's, that's uh, large over Antarctica because of chlorine and fluoro fluorine, which are fluorochlorocarbons. And some polymers can be converted back to monomers and remade into virgin polymers, and that's a good thing. All right? So that's plastic from renewable materials. And guess what, folks? You survived Chapter 9. Thanks for hanging out with me.